Welcome, everyone, to the Dark Forest. How many of you were ever in the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts growing up as a young child? Well, I'm sure you might even very well have a story or two yourself. If you have any stories that you would like me to narrate, email me your story at zackbabytv at gmail.com. Now... Let's get spooky. Be prepared, I whispered to myself. Be prepared. I whispered again, then again, and then another time after that. As I whispered this phrase on repeat, I packed my bag full of all the things I was certain I'd need. Even then, though, I was certain that I would forget something. I always have. I always did. Anyways, I digress. I'm not very comfortable giving my name out, but let me just tell you a little bit about myself. In this present time, I am 21 years old, a senior in college, and I was once a Boy Scout. Very proud and active Boy Scout at that, starting from the age of five with the Tiger Cubs. I was constantly involved with everything pertaining to the craft, or crafts in the case of the number of merit badges there are. Though I loved every bit of scouting activity almost equivalently, the one I loved above all else was probably its most commonly known one, camping. Not only was it great fun being able to hang out with friends around the campfire and sing American Pie, or whatever other song might fit the occasion, but it was also quite unnerving, to say the least, just because out in the middle of nowhere. Now, I'm not trying to say that I enjoy being scared or anything, but I certainly enjoy the rush of adrenaline, the pure excitement of what camping really was. Just being out there in the untamed wilderness, in a place where mankind had not found any sense of true safety or comfort in since the first few centuries of its own existence. It just goes to show why the word bravery is a part of the scout law. Successfully spending the entire night out in such an unpredictable and potentially hostile environment can make all sense of fear seemingly wash away one will feel like they can face anything, do anything, or at least that's how I once felt. So, back to me packing my bag. It was a Friday afternoon in October, close to Halloween, ironically enough. I was only a freshman in high school, 14 years old at the time of the trip, which I'd be leaving for the following Saturday morning. I could still remember what forest it was that we were going to. It was somewhere in the middle of Bear Mountain State Park, I think. All I knew was that our troop had never really been there before, not even before I joined. In the Scoutmaster's own words, they were trying to mix things up for a change and give us the sense of real wilderness. My dad, being one of the Scoutmasters, clarified this statement for me later on. He explained that the place was much farther out than our previous campouts, and much more isolated away from civilization. My heart raced from pure excitement as he further explained that we would be hiking in order to get to our location a good five miles at that. All we'll have to camp is whatever we can carry on our backs, he concluded with a smile. That was about two weeks ago. Now, here we are packing the car then hugging my mom goodbye. As we turned the corner to leave our street, I looked behind my seat and into the trunk at what little supplies we had. The two tents we had were just about the smallest I've ever seen. They could only fit about one person each, lest one be willing to sleep on top of the other. Their size I could only compare to which that of a dining room table, which was relatively smaller than most of the other tables I might add. There is only one other thing I might compare them to, though I'd rather not say. We drove for over two hours, yet with such a long drive, only about a quarter of it was spent in the modern world. 
In but the first half hour, we had already sped past the last of any building that stood to be more than two stories tall, then left the highway about ten minutes after that. From there, we were consumed in a strange yet familiar world, one that I had frequented many times before. There were still some buildings to be seen amongst the overgrown fields and towering trees, but spotting one was about as infrequent as spotting another car traveling the opposite direction, or even a deer alongside of the road. Even in the daylight, during the autumn season better yet, both the living and inanimate objects one could see about the wild terrain were shrouded over by the ever-thickening layers of twisted branches and browning leaves. At some points, I would even find my eyes fooling me into believing that the withered stump of a long-since fallen tree was actually the shadow of a stranger, a ghost if you will, just hauntingly staring out from the trees to watch the pass by. The dirt and rock on the road grew constantly rougher upon reaching the last thirty minutes of our journey. The sound of our stock in the back of the van rattled so loudly from the bumping of the vehicle that I swear we were carrying a grand load of heavy steel beams, ones used to build a frame a massive skyscraper. My dad snickered. Well, he called over the commotion, it's a good thing we didn't take your mother's car, am I right? I snickered too as I answered back. Yeah, she'd probably have our heads on spikes. We both laughed. Another hour had passed by when I turned around and realized that I couldn't see our van anymore. Beyond those few scouts that had laundered behind us as we hiked, all there was to view was the front line of trees that overshadowed those further back in the scenery. Those other trees were only discernible by the wind's steady movement of their dark outlined branches and the crackling snapping noises they made on occasion. Then, I could see something else moving amongst it. Something, no, many things, that moved through the foremost tree line. The collection of small black shapes fluttered in multiple directions, some up into the sky and others between the lower and higher branches. Just barely over the other scouts' conversations, I could hear the tweeting going back and forth, one of the few sounds of nature that one could also take a listen to back in our suburban neighborhood. I looked back forward, past the other scouts and leading scout masters that my father chatted with, to see up over the hill as we climbed. There was not much to gander at for a few moments, but then we finally crossed over the last bit of the slope, bringing all that was good into view. It was an unspeakably massive work of natural art. The valley that laid over the base of our current high ground was deep and wide like the aftermath of a deadly asteroid impact on Earth, but I would be lying if I wasn't to say it was one of the most incredibly gorgeous things I had ever seen in my life. It was like a physical rainbow, what with the autumnal colors that formed endless lines of red, yellow, and then red again, but then green at the outer edges, where the pit finally reached the limit. Such was where the pine trees lay untouched by the seasonal drop in everyday temperature, whilst those that ran down the middle were unable to withstand it. It was still one and a half hours until midday, yet the sun beamed down almost vertically upon the landscape, the assemblage of colors gleaming as though if it was a diamond or a coating of snow in late January. Off to the left was a mountain. Bare mountain, I assumed, looking down upon the breathtaking peace. It was as though it was the Creator itself, looking down from the heavens to indulge in the splendorous image of what had gathered together. I will never forget that moment that one moment of pure joy where all seemed right with the world, that moment where all hostile things had seemingly melted away from this truly wild land, ceasing to exist. Just that one perfect moment. It laid on my mind as we sat around the fire together some eight or nine hours later. We now sat somewhere at the valley's center, somewhere between two lines of the red and yellow painted trees. We had worked long and hard that day. The hiking was one thing, 
but the hours of collecting branches and logs were a whole nother story. Gathering firewood was, without a doubt, the only activity I truly hated in scouting. The scoutmasters were sticklers when it came to it, always insisting that we never had enough. I've mocked them for it too, joking that we might as well just burn the whole forest down. Then again, it was always an impressive fire, especially that particular night. We had to sit at least six feet away from it. It was so hot. The sun was sitting just at the valley's edge, its light creeping over in an even more brilliant red than the one of the fire, when at the same time Scoutmaster Daniels unimaginably pulls out his guitar. The fact that he would bring it up this far with all the natural obstacles to get through was just maddening to me. The fun that followed, however, made me easily forget. We sang any song that we could think of for a seemingly endless amount of time. One person even requested we sing that ridiculously annoying campfire song from Spongebob Squarepants, which Scoutmaster Daniels unfortunately accepted. Then again, having grown up watching the show, I did end up singing along just a little bit. It was around the time that the fire in our lanterns became the only source of light left in the woods that we began to tell our annual ghost stories. These were nothing new to me. I had heard all of the classic ones like Bigfoot, The Hook, Bloody Mary, and so forth. There was even this joke story we would tell. It was about a serial killer who was just a simple window wiper looking to offer his service to someone. I believe it was called The Viper. Yes, The Viper was its title. I had become so accustomed to these stories that I remarkably began to doze off a bit. I let out a yawn. The long, overspoken tales of the boogeyman became like a white noise, minuscule background noises. The boogeyman did not hinder my slumber. I leaned my head back in my little pop-up chair and gazed into the air above. In the shadows, the branches almost resembled tangled and twisting spiderwebs that stretched across the small fissure in the forest canopy. Through it, though, I could make out the night sky. The stars were seemingly of endless numbers and scope, no speck of cloud to be spotted anywhere between them. The crystal clear nature of it made me think for a minute, then finally declare that I would sleep without my tent's rainfly that night. When I finally did turn in, the fun was still at its height around the fire pit. It almost seemed to have grown since I had left. The light from the flames gleamed brighter than ever before and casted the blackened outlines of moving persons all along the tent walls. The shadows mingled with those of the swaying trees that rustled and crackled in a way so similar to that of the burning wood. This level of commotion miraculously did not hold me back from falling unconscious. My eyelids began to filter even so slightly until the darkness eventually took me. The sounds of twigs snapping and the people laughing then fell to a whisper, and then silence. The memory of that rainbow-like valley was the last thing I saw before my eyes popped back open. What greeted them was once again the sight of the star-filled sky that glistened through the hole in the treetops above. I had no idea what hour of the night it was. It was no doubt late, what with the light of the flame and its embers being totally extinguished, leaving no shadows or outlines upon the tent walls as before. All chatter outside was now ceased, no steps of shoes upon the leaves, grass, or twigs. The tents around my own were now full. Inside one of many lay those now dozing yet lacking any loud breath or snore. The crickets were seemingly absent too, not giving off even the slightest and most quiet chirp. Other steps and calls of the wild were undiscernible by any especially eye. The tent walls did not move or creak with the breeze, nor did any of the trees. There was a heavy lack of branches crackling and snapping from involuntary movement, no rustling of leaves or small twigs upon the ground. The night was almost unnaturally quiet. Something then broke the silence. A growl. A very low and guttural growl. I felt a pain in my stomach as it wrenched the air once more. 
I could feel my mouth then begin to fill up slightly more with saliva. I signed out of pure annoyance. I always ended up eating very little on these trips. Now it was costing me some well-deserved slumber. I signed once again. The only bit of grub within reach was a large bag tied up to a tree some twenty yards away from where I lay. The scoutmasters had done this to ensure that no large animals could get to it, so I decided, what the hell, and sat up while fumbling through my left pocket. It was empty. My heart skipped a beat as I then went for my backpack. I unzipped every pouch, looking through every other cup holder and fold that might contain something anything. Dang it, I whispered. My flashlight was nowhere to be found. I was more annoyed than ever before. I just knew I would forget something. I always did. Had the firelight not lent me some illumination as I was preparing for bed, maybe I would have realized my mistake sooner. Either way, I was getting to that food bag. It didn't matter what darkness might hinder me, I would never fall back asleep on an empty stomach. I again looked up through the roof of the tent. Through the tangled web of branches above me lay the multitudes of stars as always, but off to the right, half hidden by the much thicker layers of brush, a pale yet brilliant glow was shining down. A lunar phase was unclear due to it being partially cut off. Aside from the stars, it seemed to be my only bit of light. I unzipped the front of the tent, slowly and steadily, as not to disturb any of the other tents. I crept out, and the darkness was, at first, an almost endless and pitch black. My eyes then began to adjust to the shadows. What unveiled was the outlines of trees and some other tents that lay close to my own. I threw on my boots and began to make my way and slowly walk across to the saintly illuminated land about me. I looked up into the trees, and admittedly felt a chill run down me. In fairy tales, you'd probably find the setting of a haunted wood with blackened and barren trees, a place where only goblins, werewolves, and witches can find a place to call home. In that moment, staring into those sparsely detailed outlines of the forest, it almost gave me the feeling of being in that sort of environment. I even half expected to hear a howl somewhere off in the distance. Luckily, I did not, but I did hear my stomach groan again. Another slight pain filled my stomach. I began to watch the forest floor to ensure I didn't trip on any loose rocks or tree roots as I walked. Thankfully, there weren't many to be mindful of. What I did see, though, was the specks of moonlight that dotted the ground. Their dim glow seemed to flicker in and out with the slight movements of branches, what little movement there was with the lack of wind. The forest was still as silent as ever. It was so quiet that I could hear my own small breaths creeping over my lips. My stomach growling again, another slight pain filled my stomach. Then, after a few more steps, I came to the foot of one particularly large object, I looked up and felt my heart almost jump from relief. There was the rope, tied strong around the middle of the trunk. Some twenty-odd feet above me was the sack of food. Now it was a matter of taking it down. As I reached for the rope, my stomach growled again. I felt no significant pain in my stomach. Another growl. No pain. Yet another growl. No pain. My heart jumped again this time much harder. The growl rang out again, this time much louder. It was coming from off to my left. I shot my head in that direction and my eyes fell on nothing but shadow. The shrouded figure of trees and some bushes was all that was there to make out, in between the shapeless open void that lay ahead. I stared into the darkness for about a minute and saw nothing. Just as I was about to turn back to the tree though, I took notice to one area of the scene, an object that appeared to be somewhat darker than the rest. It almost seemed to be growing the more I looked at it, and after some time I began to pick up on a collection of new noises, the sounds of dirt, twigs, and leaves reacting to some kind of pressure. It grew louder and louder and louder. Something 
was coming. What it was, I did not know, but that was all the more reason to get back to my tent. Scouting had taught me enough about the nocturnal beast that stalked this environment. For all I knew, it could have been a bear or even a mountain lion. I took my hands back from the rope, not loosening in the knot, and slowly began to make my escape. As I crept away, I kept my eyes focused on the spotches of scant moonlight and to ensure that I did not step on any loose objects that could possibly create a loud enough sound. I didn't hear anything else for a while. The journey back to the tent seemed to take longer than it did to find the tree. After what felt like two minutes, I passed by the first darkened shape of the tent. When I reached the presumed center of the site, the sounds that that thing's movement kicked up again, it seemed to be quicker now. I walked closer and closer to my tent, and all the while the sounds got quieter and quieter. Realizing this, I spared a moment to think. I was considering maybe just going to one of the leader's tents or even my dad's tent. I could wake up the whole site that way and scare that thing off. I heard it move again. Crack! For a moment, I assumed it had just stepped on a particularly large and therefore louder branch. Then, when it came to me, I ran. I ran as though being pursued by hell itself, which may have very well been the case. The sounds of leaves and twigs crackling beneath my quickened steps made me cringe. My heartbeat slammed as I heard the same kinds of sounds still close behind me. Miraculously, I had left my tent door sitting wide open. I jumped inside, zippering the door up, then began scrambling through my bag. I found my knife sitting at the bottom of the most foremost pocket. The one thing I never forget to bring on any trips. I fell flat onto the top of my sleeping bag and waited. No more sounds. I waited in silence. I waited anxiously. All I did was stare up through the tent's roof, knife flicked open and clenched tightly against my chest. The stars were still all up there, flickering through the leaves. In the middle now stood the full presence of the moon. I kept my eyes focused on it like a pet on its owner while they eat at the dinner table. I waited. I waited for what seemed like more than an hour. There was not even the slightest creak of the tent from any small breeze. My stomach now seemed to stop grumbling, as though it too understood the situation. After some time, I finally heard something. Something low and heavy. Bumps. Two bumps that pounded steadily in my ears with so much as half a second's pause in between. Boom, 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 boom. My pulse was racing like this from the moment I had entered the tent. My pulse was racing like this from the moment that I entered the tent, but now it was worse than ever. Boom, 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 boom. The night remained deadly inaudible. I continued to stare at the moon. Boom, 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 boom. The handle of the knife was cold, yet I could feel the sweat breaking out. It soaked my palms and some even dotted my brow. I continued to stare at the moon. Boom, 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 crack. It seemed to have been almost two hours when I first heard that sound. It was loud, and therefore it was close. It seemed to have come from about ten feet away, through to the right-hand wall of the tent. I did not keep my eyes off of the moon. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. Crack! I was at first confused. The confusion then quickly turned to terror, though. It had come from beyond the left wall at this time, now closer to the previous sound. Whatever this thing was, it was moving fast. Unnaturally fast, in fact, at least for any large animal up here in the northeast. 
I did not keep my eyes off of the moon. As far as I was concerned, its light was the only real sense of protection, my glorified butter knife be damned. Yet, all I wanted for it to become sunlight, all I wanted was for this night to be over. Boom, 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 crack. It came through the front door this time. The door didn't move or rip. Boom, 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 boom. Crack! Again, it came through the front door. Silence. Then, after about a minute, the growling started back up. It was easier to hear now being that the beast was so close, and it was truly one of the most, if not the most strange and horrifying sounds I have ever heard. What it sounded like, at least to me, was a human gargling water yet deep in pitch, and blended in with something of a low-pitched humming noise. I continued to gaze intensely at the half-formed orb in the sky. My whole body tensed up. I gripped the handle of the dagger even tighter, though it almost slipped from my hands due to the profuse amount of sweat. I had to cover my mouth with my hand, what with how heavy I was not breathing. I felt my veins run cold as I heard another branch crack to my left, but I did not take my eyes off the moon. Another growl rang from the night. It sounded angry. It was as though it was an animal standing its ground, asserting its dominance. My heart skipped a beat upon realizing this. I began to tremble, as though shivering from a chill in the air. I again almost dropped the knife when I heard the right hand wall itself almost seem to growl at me. My nervous system kicked in for the first time in hours. The moon left my sight, my eyes. My head darted over to the right hand wall and remained focused solely upon it. For about two minutes or more, I stared at it, almost in a trance as I waited for the next crack or growl to resonate from somewhere, anywhere. Silence. For an uncontrollable amount of time, there was nothing but silence. My heartbeat, once again, was all that I could hear, but it did not cease to pound. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. There was no crack of a branch. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. No growl rang through the night. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. I turned my head back to the roof and resumed staring into the pale, rounded light. I was so tired now, my eyelids began to fall. The moon was going dark. No! Not now. I couldn't fall asleep now. It was still out there. It had to be. I opened my eyes again. Everything still seemed dark. I took a deep breath and shook my head violently, fighting back the urge to fall unconscious. For a moment, I was somewhat calm, enough so that it seemed that my heartbeat was beginning to slow. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. I resumed being as I was before, staring into the darkness above. Darkness. My heartbeat quickened up again, almost faster than ever. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. The moon was gone. My only real sense of protection. My nightlight. Gone. The knife finally fell from my hand as I again began to tremble. It rolled down my stomach and, upon hitting the tent floor, made a metallic thud against a rock somewhere beneath the canvas surface. In almost the same moment it happened, the dark itself seemed to move. As it did, a glow began to quickly form around it, a glow so familiar that it could only be one thing. Moonlight. The creature, the beast, whatever it was, was standing over the tent, staring down at me on my sleeping bag. The light of the moon and the stars outlined its ungodly figure. Oh. 
a humanoid creature. It appeared to be, yet its head was almost too perfectly curved. It was almost like a sculpted head, one with no ears or even any hair. Its skin seemed to be a bit rough in texture, but the color of it was indescribable. The most disturbing part of it all, though, was the shape of its body. While its head was somewhat skinny, the body was bloated and completely malformed. The right arm was so much bigger and distorted than its left arm, as though it has been injected with some kind of super steroid. Beyond this, the facial features were completely unseen. All there was to behold was its gargantuan shadow. Then, very slowly, it raised up its much skinnier arm and began running its hand down the netting of the tent. Doing so revealed its horribly twisted hand, its weird long figures making something of a scratching sound as it slowly cut through the thin, thread-like netting. I wept. I wept hard. The tears streamed down in droves. I began to hyperventilate. It grew worse and worse as the netting fell more and more in two forms from the creature's claws. I was no longer a scout, no longer a man of courage who had spent the past twelve or more hours on the camping trip of a lifetime, no longer the one who could see the civility in an unpredictable hostile environment. Now, I was nothing more than a child, a child that lay weak and cowardly in his darkened bedroom, shrinking away from the boogeyman that lurked in the shadows, lurked inside nothing more than old tales that ran throughout their head. Only now, the old tales were real. The boogeyman was real. <laughs> There was no method of escape to be found here. I was trapped, trapped in what was, inevitably, my final resting place. My tent, I now must say, is comparable to that of a coffin. Above me stood my undertaker. Already dead. I was already dead, and yet I found myself grabbing for the knife. I held the cold blade up to the beast and shut my eyes tightly. Even in the darkness, I could still sense its movement. Its gargantuan figure was reaching down to me. Hey! The call came from what seemed to be the back wall. Following it was the sound of movement, what sounded like two or three things rushing in my direction. The creature snarled in response, but that snarl then quickly morphed into a shrill wail, one that echoed for what seemed like miles in the night. For a moment, I half opened my eyes as it screamed seemingly in pain. In the blurriness of the scene, I saw very little. I did not see an attacker or even hear some sort of struggle between two entities. Rather, I saw the creature, the boogeyman, in full display, shining in a beam of light for but the briefest of seconds. Hey! Yeah! Go! Get out of here! In those few moments before it had taken off, I could remember only two things about it, the pink of its skin and the pale white of its eyes. The wailing echoed farther and farther away into the distance as I once again made eye contact with the moon. Its pale light was quickly overpowered, though, by many far brighter lights. The lights that truly protected me. I shut my eyes to them and saw nothing else. When I woke... The scene had changed. Above me was a pale light, yes, but it wasn't the moon or even heaven for that matter. It was a lamp. I sat up and found that I was inside now. The walls were painted white and I saw, hanging on one of them, a picture of a pink-skinned humanoid. A diagram of human muscles. I was laying in a bed at the hospital, the nurse sitting at my bedside, looking at me and spoke. Oh, good. You're finally awake. Wait here a moment. I'll get the doctor. 
The doctor came in about two minutes later, my parents following swiftly. He explained what had happened. Everything all right, okay? Nothing serious happened. You simply were in shock. Shock? I said, slightly confused. Yes, shock, he answered. You're truly a lucky kid, though. What, almost getting killed by that thing? Your father and the others got there just in time, scared it away with one of their shouts and their flashlights. What'd you say it was again? A black bear, right? My dad nodded. I was flabbergasted. I was completely beside myself. A black bear? A damn black bear of all things? My dad had to have gotten a good look at it. He had to have seen its colors of pink and white, its absolutely grotesque figure. But I... I looked hard at my dad, frowning, but the face he gave me in response was enough to mellow me down. The look one gives as if to say, Don't. I... I guess you're right. Luckiest child in the world. I faked a smile at the doctor. He smiled back as he told my parents to follow him out of the room. As they did, my dad looked back at me, smiling slightly and nodded. I nodded back. He is right, you know. There are very few who would believe it. I'm sure that even you are having your doubts as you would read this. Now, if you were to ask me what it was that I had encountered in the woods that night, I still don't have an answer. I'm still madly searching for one to this day. Hell, I've even considered going back on that trail with a loaded firearm this time around. But even then... I don't think I'd find anything. That's probably how it will remain. I mean, no one's ever captured Bigfoot, right? No cop has ever arrested or booked a hooligan by butchering a young couple by his hook or something. No real records are out there of someone having been slaughtered by a woman in their mirror. No parent has ever claimed with dignity to have seen the boogeyman hiding underneath their child's bed. Thus... My story is nothing more than a simple campfire tale. It is just as much a joke as the story of the viper. With that said, I ask of you these simple requests. If you too are a Boy Scout, or even just a simple lover of nature, think twice about the shadows that cast amongst the trees. Think hard and long about those stories that you hear around the campfire, most important of all, though, if you plan to spend the night amongst those black and twisted shapes, having nothing but the moonlight to stand at your side, remember these two simple words. Be prepared. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed the Boy Scout terror tale tonight. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. And please, if you have a scary story you would like to send me, email me at zackbabytv at gmail.com. Have a good night.